just going to finish off with a couple kind of supplementary uh, slides here going off of the idea of, of a culture of resistance and uh, using some other additional tactical examples. So I think there's an idea really that's prominent on the left that when things get bad enough, then at that point people will change and then there will be a mass movement and then we can you know, do all of these other things. Um, and so one of the things that I've, I've studied in, in studying resistance movements more generally is resistance movements in, in Europe, of course, because there were so many that sprang up during World War II when countries became occupied. And you can learn a lot from these kind of accelerated uh, developments that happen in many different places. And so uh, one of the questions that I often come across is, why wasn't there uh, very much resistance in Germany at the heart of fascism? Because, of course, there was huge resistance all across Europe in occupied Europe, but there was relatively little in, in Germany itself. Um, and so one of the things that people will, will tell me when I kind of have asked this question in the past, well, they'll say, it's, you know, the Gestapo, there was a police state, people were too scared about their families, it was too dangerous in Germany. But of course, that really applied anywhere. I mean, it applied in Poland or Czechoslovakia or Denmark. It was always dangerous everywhere. And in those places, people resisted in much greater numbers and more effectively. I didn't really understand it until I came across a public opinion survey that had been done in Germany in, in 1952. So this is a picture of you know, the reconstruction of Berlin in 52. And at that point, this was you know, after the war, after uh, the Nuremberg trials. So the crimes of the Nazis were really very well known, uh, including the Holocaust and medical experimentation and all of that. And so there was a survey of public opinion to ask people, um, if you had known during the war, if you had known of the crimes of the Nazis, would it have, would it have been appropriate to resist? They weren't asked you know, if they personally would resist, because obviously for almost all of them the answer was no. They were just asked, would it have been appropriate? And only 40% of people said yes which is appalling, but not surprising. And then they asked a follow-up question, which was, OK, so let's say uh, there was a war on at the time, which, of course, in any fascist, authoritarian, expansionist country is, is always, is all the time. They were asked, well, then if there was a war on, would it have been OK to resist? And the number of people who said yes dropped to 20%. Um, so I think that this is really important to kind of understand and, and internalize that people who are not part of a culture of resistance, who are part of the dominant culture and identify with that authority, are not going to be able to muster that kind of resistance in mass numbers, even when the crimes are really obvious. Um, and so, okay, well, these are, you know, the regular kind of German people who maybe were benefiting from the expansion and the economic boost of the war and this sort of thing. So what about um, people who were you know, German citizens who were caught up in, in the concentration camps and who were caught up in the Holocaust itself. Surely they would have been, uh, you know, converted. Surely they would have undertaken resistance when they're personally confronted with, you know, their own murder and the destruction of their family. Um, and we can actually answer this question because there were people like Bruno Biedelheim, who's a psychologist and a survivor of the concentration camps. Um, and so he wrote quite a bit about this uh, in, in his later career. And I'll read something that uh, he wrote uh, from his experience in Dachau and Buchenwald concentration camps. And he said, quote, non-political middle-class prisoners, a minority group in the concentration camps, were those least able to withstand the initial shock. They were utterly unable to understand what had happened to them and why. More than ever, they clung to what had given them self-respect up to that moment. Even while being abused, they would assure the SS they had never opposed Nazism. Their only objection was that they had become objects of a persecution which in itself must be just since the authorities had opposed it. They rationalized their difficulty by insisting it was all a mistake. So they were saying, you know, well, sure, uh, it's bad for me, but it's just kind of a misunderstanding, which is one of the basic, you know, kind of liberal uh, misapprehensions that we've been talking about again and again. Um, and and Bietelheim goes on to talk about how uh, a lot of those people became collaborators and assisted the, uh, the, the Stasi, or, or pardon me, assisted the SS and assisted uh, the concentration camp guards, even though they really got nothing out of it. Um, and so 
you know, that example is one where uh, there wasn't a culture of resistance that really developed effectively. But of course, uh, many cultures of resistance do develop effectively, as we've been talking about. But they tend to take time, and they tend to, pro to kind of progress through different phases. So I'd like to talk about, for a minute, the development of, uh, of abolition strategy and the struggle against slavery and abolition tactics in the United States. So uh, early um, white abolitionists in the US really based their strategy on moral suasion. So their idea was that, you know, especially religious people like Quakers, their idea was that they would go around from, you know, kind of house to house or farm to farm and, and try to convince people on a one-on-one -on -one basis that slavery was wrong and that people should liberate their slaves. And so they would use, you know, moral arguments, am I not a brother and a man, you know, mm -hmm. saying that slavery was a sin, that it was an affront to God and this sort of thing. And of course they did have some success in that way. I think there are always kind of moral early adopters. There's a certain percent of the, of the population that will be, that will take on those moral arguments. But they reached a limit. You know, there's so many, so many people who can be kind of convinced in that, in that fashion when the, the plantation owners or the slaveholders are personally and economically benefiting so much from that system. Um, and so at the same time, there was this increasing development of the Underground Railroad, which was led by people like Harriet Tubman. Um, and you know, there's a misconception about the Underground Railroad that it was something that was kind of run by well-meaning whites who would you know, then risk their lives to help people who were enslaved to escape. But actually, the, the Underground Railroad was mostly run by black people um, who were often you know, operating pretty much alone or in, in small groups, as, as kind of underground movements often do.